Well, in Ephesians 6, we're aware that we're involved in a warfare and a conflict. And one of the things we want to give attention to today is to know the enemy. In the case of the devil, that's not going to be a lot of fun. It's not my favorite subject. But if we go to war and we don't know who the enemy is, we're going to be at a big disadvantage. Can you imagine? Okay, men, we're going to war. Well, who's the enemy? I don't know. How many men they got? Don't know. What kind of weapons they're going to use? I don't know. How are we going to recognize them? I don't know. What are they after? What's their objectives? Can we stop them? I don't know. Are we going to make it? I don't know. So what we want to do is know the enemy's strengths, objectives, weaknesses, if any, so that we can defend ourselves, so we can exploit those weaknesses, nullify their strength, defend ourselves, and stand after having done everything. So what we're looking at today is in chapter 6 of Ephesians. And again, picking it up in verse 10, where Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, here in this first section of our spiritual warfare, we learn about the enemy's name, his titles, and the number of them. The leader of the enemy is the devil, Satan. And the name Satan means adversary, means enemy. It means somebody who hates and opposes God, Jesus, his Messiah, all of God's people, and all of mankind in general. He's the one who has declared war. And the other name given to him is the devil. That means the slanderer or accuser. And it means to accuse unjustly in a way that slanders one's reputation, slanders one's character. You know, it's not possible to kill God outright, directly. I'm sure the devil would if he could, but what he does instead is to slander God, is to murder his reputation, to lower his esteem in people's eyes, and also to accuse God's people. Now, what we want to know about the devil, first of all, if you want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, there are a few sections in scripture where we get uh, glimpses of, of the devil and who he is and how he got to be the devil in the first place. One of these places is in Ezekiel 28. And in this chapter, you'll notice that Ezekiel is speaking, first of all, to the prince of a city called Tyre. And then he begins speaking to the king of Tyre. Two different persons. One is the earthly ruler of that city. And the king of Tyre speaks about somebody that could not be human. So, a lot of scholars have noticed this and suggest that we see here a description of God or from God about the devil. Now this is what it says in Ezekiel 28 verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre 
and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever." Now, the first thing we want to notice about this is that God calls him several times here, cherub. And that is a Hebrew word meaning living creature. It does not refer to fat babies with wings, kind of roly-poly and dimply. That is a creation of the Renaissance. But elsewhere in Ezekiel, this word Cherub in its plural, cherubim, refer to angelic beings, beings that God created. And again, God emphasizes that he created this being. This being did not come into existence by himself, by his own doing. He is a creation of God. And therefore, because he is a creation of God, he is not God. He is a creation. There was a time when he was not. Now, the next thing we want to notice is that he was perfect. The seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. In other words, people say, well, if there is a devil, why did God create him? The answer is, God did not create the devil. The devil made himself in this aspect. That is, at a certain point, this angelic being became filled with violence within, became defiled, profane, which means common, and proud, lifted up, exalted in his heart. And the reason is, in verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. At a certain point, this created being says, I'm beautiful. I'm gorgeous. I am worthy to be worshipped. And decided that for himself. Now there's this other aspect in here about defiling your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Now, this was a feature of this ancient city-state called Tyre. With Tyre and Sidon, its neighboring city, they were known for being seafaring merchants. And they carried on trade with all of the nations that are around the Mediterranean Sea. And they were the merchant princes. And they discovered important fundamental facts about merchandising. For one thing, you buy 
where there is abundant supply and these things are plentiful and therefore cheap. You take them to some place where they are not plentiful, they're scarce, and because they're scarce, you can command a high price for them. That's the rule of merchandising. Buy low, sell high. And there's a certain amount of iniquity or inequality in that, isn't there? Because over here in this place, oh well, not so many, you know, we got tons of this stuff and it's not that expensive. Over here, you mean you have that? Wow, I'll pay anything for that. That's, that's great. Well, what's it really worth? The answer is, whatever the market will bear. You know how this year's iPod is more expensive than last year's iPod? And as soon as the new iPods come out, the old iPod is 45% off, 50% off. Begs the question, how much, worth, how much was it worth to begin with? Are they losing any money at all? No, because the rule is buy low, sell high. I think I've told the story one time about the jeweler's apprentice who sold the 9,999 pound diamond bracelet for nine pounds and 99 pence. And the jeweler was furious. And he yelled at him and he screamed at his apprentice and just said, what in the world are you thinking? And he screams at him for an hour. And he says, all right, let's keep going. I mean, at least we made five pounds on the deal. Right? This is what we're talking. What is anything worth? Well, somehow trading is involved. And if you ask me how, I say I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. But I want you to think about this for a second. Remember that when Jesus came to the temple, he found in the temple merchandisers. And they were there to perform, it may be said, a reasonable function. They were there to change money, and they were there to also provide sacrifices that were approved by the priests. So a person who was you know, on a pilgrimage, came to Jerusalem, could offer an acceptable sacrifice. But what they did was to make the sacrifices expensive, requiring lots of money. And to exchange for the proper money, they took a big commission. In other words, all of the worship of God, everything that was going on, these people turned into merchandising and for their own benefit. And this is what Jesus said. It is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. What they did was turn the worship of God into something for personal profit. And that's what I think this angelic being was involved in. Somehow turning the worship of God into something for his personal profit. And what it means is, is that the devil became the devil by focusing upon himself. Now we get more of this in Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 14. If you'll turn there. Now, the context of Isaiah 14 is taking up a taunt against the king of Babylon. And again, I think it's referring to the angelic power behind the ruler of Babylon. This is what it says in verse three. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and no one hinders. 
The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. Hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. They shall all speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you, and the worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, this is what the devil said in his heart that caused him to fall. And earlier where God says, I destroyed you, O cherub who covers. He says, in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He's saying, I will be like the Most High. In his pride, in focusing upon himself, the devil decided, why Shouldn't I be God? I'm worthy to be worshipped. I'm beautiful. Why shouldn't I have the job? And so he set his goal to be like the Most High. What he did was actually bring condemnation upon himself and judgment for his sin. Now, that is the leader of the enemy. But there's more. If you turn back to Ephesians 6. Remember Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. That is, there is more than just the devil that we face. And they're referred to also as his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. In Revelation 12, 4, this great dragon, which is later identified for us as the devil and Satan, is pictured as drawing a third of the stars of heaven with his tail and throwing them down to the earth. Now, if you think about how many stars there are just in our galaxy alone, which is millions upon millions, and realize that a galaxy is one of billions and billions of galaxies, and the devil in this picture here has really dominated and taken authority over a third of those, the enemy we face is numerous. And what we want to notice is that they still have power and authority. God gave them authority over different things, part of le at least which we know of as nations. We see that from Daniel chapter 12, where there are an angelic beings over nations struggling with one another. What they're able to do is exert direction and control over the entire world. Remember back in Ephesians chapter 2 that there is a course of this world and it is dominated by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Here in Ephesians 6.12, he says, they're the rulers of the darkness of this age. The darkness of this age. That is... The sin of this world 
It's rebellion against God, the lack of knowledge of God, the lack of understanding about God, the pride, the wickedness, the lust, the persecution of God's people. These angelic authorities are exerting power and control to keep that going. If you've ever wondered why it's difficult to be a Christian where it was really easy to be a sinner, this is why. Because when you received Jesus, you started going against the current. All the current in this world, the the flow that all the nations are caught in are on this broad path leading to destruction. But something happened to you. You became alive with Christ. And you started swimming in the opposite direction. And that's when you notice the pull, the tug, going in the opposite direction. You think, man, this isn't easy. When does it get easy? Their answer is, it doesn't get easy. And there you are, swimming the opposite direction. You notice that you're bumping shoulders with people who are going the opposite way. And they think you're rude because you're not going along with them. You're bumping in the family and you're bumping on the job. And you're not going the same direction we are. And you know, you're different. Why can't you be like the rest of us? You're feeling that, that pull, that current going the opposite direction. Now, Here we come to the devil's objective. What is the objective in all this warfare? And we've seen already that the devil wants to be God. He wants to exert control, direct everything. He wants to be worshipped as God. Not only that, he wants to oppose God and wipe out everything that has to do with the true God. And that also applies to the Bible, the knowledge about God, and God's people, who themselves are direct witnesses and testimony to the existence of God and to the life of God and the truth of God. Now, the degree to which the devil wants to do away with us lies in that word, stand. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. That word refers to being established, planted, set up. And, you know, standing is something that an adult person learns how to do. It's the transition between being a, an infant to being actually a toddler and moving towards maturity is this ability to stand. And you know, at the beginning, it's not like very easy. You kind of, kind of wobbly. And that's why you got to start when you're a small child because when you fall down, it's not that far to go. You're not going to hurt yourself that bad. Plus, you're equipped with shock absorbers. So if you all of a sudden sit down, it's like you hardly feel it. Do that now, you would hurt yourself. You can get killed falling down, right? So this is what God has enabled us to do. He is establishing us right now so that we stand as mature believers and established. Now, When I looked up the idea of establish in my thesaurus, I was looking for the opposite of that. The opposite of stand is fall. Now that's something that's already happened to the devil. The devil fell. The devil wants to make us fall. You know, that idea of fall is also used in battle. When somebody falls in battle, it doesn't mean they tripped. It means they got killed. When I looked up the opposite of establish, I got five words. And I'm not making this up. This is the thesaurus, 
Say that three times fast. The opposite of establish is eradicate, exterminate, extirpate, uproot, and wipe out. Now, if you look up those words, to eradicate means to altogether get rid of. Extirpate means to even wipe out knowledge, data, even the idea. Exterminate means to destroy completely. Pulling up by the roots. So really all these words point to total annihilation. God wants to establish this. He says, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. But this is what the devil is about. John, Jesus said in John 8, he was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer doesn't give life. A murderer takes life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. You know, the idea of the devil as somebody runs around in a red suit with horns, a pointed tail, and a pitchfork is okay for the devil. He doesn't mind that at all. Make fun of him, ridicule him, belittle him, or refuse to believe that he exists. He doesn't mind that at all. That doesn't slow him down at all. But don't think that because people make fun of him as a cartoon character that he has cartoon motives. The devil is out to kill. In fact, you know, I talked with a friend of mine who called me up from Israel just the other day and was telling me about some of the stuff going on, things that have blown up a church there. And she says, you know what? I've never been this close to hell before in my life. The twistedness, the deviousness, the personality change that has come over some people, people that I've known for 10, 15 years. She says, this is as close to hell as I ever want to come. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. And she's feeling the naked hatred and brutality, and it's scaring her. That's what we're talking about here. Now, I want you to notice the strategy that the devil wants to use to annihilate us, to wipe us out, to exterminate us, destroy us completely. In verse 11, Paul wants us to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is one of the overall strategies that the devil uses against us. We're not going to look at everything this week. We're going to look at just this first one. But here we have wiles. The Greek original word for this that's translated wiles or schemes, you might have in some translations, is the Greek word methodia. And it's that word from which we derive the English word method planning, but in this sense, in in the way the word is defined in Greek, is deception, trickery, cunning. And the whole idea behind it is to cause someone to accept as true what is really false. To convince somebody that this is valid, when in reality it's not valid at all. Now, back in John 8, verse 44, besides being a murderer from the beginning, Jesus says this about the devil. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil is the one who thought up the idea of causing someone to accept as true 
what is not true. Now, why does the devil want you to believe a lie? To put your trust in something that is not true as though it were true. The idea is so that you will act upon that false premise and sin against God. That's what he wants you to do. In good faith, sincerely believing that you're right, he wants you to act contrary to God. If you sin against God and continue in it, you will die. Now, you know, Paul in this is not talking to believers. Because believers are not participants in the war. Those people who don't receive the gospel, who haven't received Jesus into their hearts, they're dead in sins and transgressions. They are not players. They are lying comfortably in the devil's bosom. That's what John says in 1 John 5. He says, we know that the whole earth The whole world lies in the bosom of the evil one. And so those people that aren't connected with God this morning, they don't believe in Jesus, no matter what they're doing, they're dead. And the devil isn't worried about them. They don't cause them a problem. It's us. Paul is speaking to those of us who have already received Jesus, who are already made alive together with Christ, The attack is upon us. Now, in Proverbs 16, verse 25, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's the conflict that we face. The very real possibility of becoming deceived and thinking this is the way to go. When it turns out, it's not the right way to go. It leads to death. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Paul is speaking to believers in that church in Corinth. And he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now Paul is speaking to believers who came out of a background like this and who were possibly some of them in danger of continuing in a lifestyle like that because of being deceived. And so he has to come out and warn them. And he says, I warn everybody like this. If you continue in sin, you must die. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8. But if by the Spirit of God you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now let's take this a step further. The essence of sin that the devil wants us to become involved in is to focus on ourselves and reason from there. And this is what the devil did. Again, in the presence of God, Somehow, he took his eyes off God and began admiring himself. Now, on one hand, this is a little bit ridiculous to contemplate. But on the other hand, every single one of us has looked in the mirror and kept on looking. You look at the shape of your nose, how your hair is doing, got any pimples? How's your complexion? And then you start trying out different faces. How's this face? How's this face? How's this face? How's this face? You start doing this stuff. You find yourself 
looking in the mirror at yourself, playing with yourself, you say, this is ridiculous, this is stupid, and you walk off, right? But you know, all we're doing is what the devil did right there where he became fascinated with himself. Now, God says he corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor. Somewhere in there, he stopped reasoning that I'm a creation of God. The reason I'm beautiful is because he made me this way. It is because of the goodness of God that I am what I am. And somewhere in there, his reason became corrected because he began to attribute to himself all that goodness. You know, we never find out where him, the supposed most high, came from. I don't ever remember not being here. I wonder if he just kind of came to be. I know I just came to be. There's some creation scientists who think that the devil figures he just evolved instead of was created. That's speculation. But at some point, he said, you know what? I am who I am. And I'm beautiful, and I'm worthy to be worshipped, and so I don't see any reason why I shouldn't be the focus of everything. So, I want to be God. And that's where he became the enemy of God. Now, you know, in the same way, the devil wants us to sin by accepting a false premise. If you look at everything that you're ensnared by, tempted by, attacked by, it all kind of comes back to this one thing, focusing on yourself. And reasoning from that position. I don't like the way this thing has worked out for me, therefore, I am angry about this. Or, I would like that because I can see that working out for my good. We reason these things out. What he wants us to do is to take this false premise, reason from there, and begin working against our own salvation. When you carry it to its logical conclusion, as we keep seeking our own, we find ourselves in direct conflict with God. We come to him with our earthly reasoning, and we say, God, I don't like the way this is working out. Here's my plan to make things better. I want you to bless it. I've got it all worked out. Please don't mess it up. Follow steps one, two, and three. The entire world is going to smell like roses. Now, you know, in all of this, if we follow this line of thinking, we're going to kill ourselves. We're going to found to be fighting against God and working against our own salvation. Case in point is the Apostle Peter. He's a believer in Jesus. When Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father is in heaven. And then when Jesus begins to directly afterward teach that he is going to be handed over to the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, that he will be scourged, condemned, crucified, and raised on the third day, Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. This will never happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you're only thinking about the things of men and you're not thinking about the things of God. What are the things of the devil? the things of men. It's me, me, me. In fact, there is a, uh, there's a beauty shop on the Hampton Hill High Street and that's what it's called. Me, me, me. Well, at least they're honest about it. This is what makes the devil the devil. And this is what makes us as believers to sin. 
me, me, me. Why? Because the devil knows that when we think that way and reason that way, we will fight against God. We will fight against our own salvation. We will blow our brains out and it will be our finger on the trigger. Now, we respond to this strategy of the devil by the gospel. In a way, we have to quit here. I can't go any further because it's just going to take too long. But if I just leave it here, we're going to be a little bit in trouble, won't we? So I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. And I'll show you what the response to this strategy is in a broad sense. Colossians 1, verse 21. This is where God has put us. Paul says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. What does the devil want to do? He wants to make you stop continuing in the gospel. He wants to move you away from the hope. So the answer is to hold fast to the gospel. Look in Colossians 2 verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are, all, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The conflict is, is there in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged. It's in what the grammatical form is, the conditional mode, meaning a possibility but not a certainty. Paul wants their hearts to be encouraged, established, knit together, but the possibility is that they're not. That's the point of the conflict. Paul wants to establish. The devil wants to uproot. And so here's what he says in verse 4. Now this I say lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And he goes on to say, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Here's the attack, moving you away, persuasive words, Philosophy, empty conceit, talking fancy. Very subtle. You ask, does it work? Yes, it does. Have you ever been deceived by the devil? I know I have. Worked really good with Adam and Eve. So here's the point. As you receive the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, how we came to the Lord was by repentance, by humility, and by faith in Jesus. Humility in the fact that we found out we were sinners. You ask anybody in the street, are you a good person? They'll go, mm, yeah. And you know, you're the averaging. You add it all up and you average it 51% or better, hey, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. Don't think about, you know, obedient to God, broken all of his Ten Commandments. They go, yeah, I'm a good person. No, you came to the point where you realized you sinned against God. You've broken all of his commandments. 
If you received what you deserved, you'd be in hell tonight. You were absolutely convinced about that. Not only that, you were convinced that you could not save yourself, that nothing you did could take away your guilt, could restore things between you and God. You became utterly convinced that nothing could save you except Jesus dying in your place and Jesus rising from the dead to give you new life. And this maybe is the place to ask, have you been convinced of that? Is that how you started? Well, if that's how you started, then that's how you keep going. Repentance, humility, and faith. You know, the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, are we gullible or are we teachable? Gullible means, hey, I'll believe anything because I'm not watching. And I'm easily duped because I don't think there's a fight on, I don't think there's a war on, nobody's out to get me, okay, I'll believe it. So we find people believing all sorts of things that aren't in the Bible. They're gullible. But on the other hand, there are people who aren't teachable. Maybe it's because they've been around for so long, they've heard every Bible study there is, and they say, okay, I've been there, done that, you can't show me anything that I don't know already. And there are some people who have come to a point where they've stopped thinking they could be wrong. And you can't convince them they're wrong. Show them chapter and verse, they say, it's not my problem, it's your problem. Or I know one person who is absolutely convinced, you can show this person chapter and verse, that the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. And she says, you know what? I was there in the revival. Everybody was speaking in tongues. That's it. And so because of experience, this person is going to reject what it says in the Bible. Light a stick of dynamite. Put it under this person. <laughs> nope. The evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Okay. You win. Your biblical ignorance is omnipotent. You win. Okay, that's good for everybody else, but what about you and what about me? On the one hand, we do not want to be gullible and just believe anything because I heard it on a cassette. Therefore, it's got to be true. On the other hand, we don't want to be those who just say, you know what? I don't care who you are. You have nothing to teach me. We want to be right there in the middle where we want to judge everything by what the Bible says, 100% truth. And we want to be open to teaching no matter where it comes from. Case in point, the Apostle Peter. Now it's the other side of Pentecost. Now he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's the apostle to the Jews. He's seen Jesus raised from the dead. And yet, you know what? Paul says in Galatians 2 that when he came to Antioch, he was to be blamed because he faltered, because he was a hypocrite. He said, certain men came from James, wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Peter went along with them. Even Barnabas was carried away. And so here's Peter now waffling on the truth of the gospel. And so Paul, of all the guys in Antioch, stood up and said to Peter, how can you do this? I'm a Jew. We're all Jews. But even us, we've believed in Jesus. And so you know what? You're wrong to do this. You know, Peter could have said, you know what, you little upstart, you little nobody, I've seen Jesus face to face. I saw him raised from the dead. He taught me personally. Now you go back there and you sit down. He could have reacted in pride, not wanting to look like, hey, you know, I don't want to be shown up to be wrong or nothing. You know, but we don't hear about this huge doctrinal mushroom cloud of Antioch blowing up because Peter accepted what Paul said. He was teachable. He's not gullible, 
but he is teachable. So you know, here's, here is a defense, a strategy for ourselves, is to be teachable. And Paul says, if we're teachable, continuing in this, abounding in it with thanksgiving, we're going to stand firm in the faith. That's where we're going to leave it for right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you don't leave us in the dark about our enemy. But you let us know how serious this warfare is, what the stakes are. It's not just a theological disputation and some meaningless dispute over names and dates and doctrine, but it's, it's our very lives that's at stake. And we want to thank you this morning for the gospel. Lord, that you came to us and saved us out of that broad path leading to destruction. And now, Lord, we want to stand against our enemy and not let him take us down. And we pray, Lord, to be teachable. Help us, Lord, to receive from you, receive from others. Help us to grow in humility, not looking at ourselves, but looking at you. Help us to grow in worshiping you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.